The Harry Potter series has been a consistent source of magic for more than two decades. Wicked. But not all of the silver screen adaptations of J.K. Rowling's works have turned out as well as others. From pacing issues to distracting book-to-screen inconsistencies to moments of shoddy direction, some of the films simply don't measure up to the rest. So, let's walk through all of the Harry Potter films, starting with the best and counting down to find out which one of them is officially the worst Harry Potter movie ever made. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban There was the Harry Potter franchise before Prisoner of Azkaban, and there was the Harry Potter franchise after. Director Alfonso Cuaron brought more than just fresh eyes to the series' third installment. He brought a whole new perspective to the magical franchise by grounding it in humanity. Cuaron had the benefit of prior films' world-building already in place, of course, but he also brought a great deal of style and gravity to the story and helped to darken the mood and ramp up the sense of true danger in the movies just in time. Even from the film's opening moments, the film seems more alive than before with performances that rang a little more true. The energy of the movie is electric and draws us into Harry's life in ways the first two films hadn't. That's why the Dementor's attacks on him are so frightening and why Sirius Black's character arc is utterly compelling to watch. Not only did the film wander back to Hogwarts, it also fundamentally altered the direction of the franchise and became a benchmark for the entire series to follow. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix by the time the fifth Harry Potter film came along, the series was starting to barrel towards its endgame. Voldemort has already returned, and lives are being lost as a result. The days of caring about house points and sneaking through the restricted section are certainly over for Harry and his pals. And in addition to the looming dangers of the outside, Order of the Phoenix really brings it home when Dolores Umbridge ushers the authoritarianism rising within the Ministry of Magic to the halls of Hogwarts. Harry and those loyal to Dumbledore must band together in secret to survive her reign. And yet, it feels like a hopeless endeavor and causes a sense of dread that's very real for audiences at home. Unlike many of its predecessors, Order of the Phoenix never feels overwhelmed by its narrative ambition. It plugs along at a brisk pace, covering the bases, including the series' first full-on wizard fight, and develops one of the series' biggest emotional payoffs in its harrowing final moments. It was director David Yates' first foray into the franchise, and it's easy to see why they kept him around after this movie struck so many high notes. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince In many ways, Half-Blood Prince actually beats Order of the Phoenix on the dramatic front. The film's impact is bolstered by a devastating third act. The film finds Harry and friends continuing to fight the good fight while unraveling the deep, dark secret that made Voldemort all but immortal. And it's a thrill to watch as the stakes get raised to immeasurably scary levels. Structured more as a pulpy detective story than a magical adventure tale, Half-Blood Prince is the one film in the series that can be qualified as a genuine slow burner. It introduces the element of Horcruxes, of Snape's ulterior motives, and decimates any sense of safety that might have remained before. Half-Blood Prince may test your patience with its pacing, and certain creative liberties in the plot might irk Potter purists, but it does deliver on the drama and nimbly sets into motion the series' big finish. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 Due to the final book's length and density, Warner Brothers decided to split the last installment of the series into two films with the hopes that David Yates and his team could give the franchise the send-off it deserved and earn an extra helping of profits, of course. Despite a wobbly start with Part 1, Yates managed to achieve a fitting end with Deathly Hallows Part 2. The closing chapter covers Harry, Hermione, and Ron's desperate search for Voldemort's horcruxes, Snape's surprising history, the epic battle of Hogwarts, and Harry's fateful showdown with the last heir of Slytherin. It's a lot of action and drama to sift through for one film, and some fans have expressed disappointment with the way the final showdown between Harry and the Dark Lord plays out. But with the many smaller battles and moments of epic heroism on display in the end, Deathly Hallows still ends with a bang. As long as you turn it off before the silly epilogue, that is. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them J.K. Rowling decided to travel back to the past for the series' next cinematic adventure. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which she scripted, follows the little-known character Newt Scamander in 1920s New York as he inadvertently unleashes a bevy of magical creatures into the muggle realm. The Big Apple proves to be a welcome change of scenery for Rowling's world. Free from the world of owl exams and teen angst, the more grown-up tale of wizards wandering the world feels fresh and offers a new lens through which to view the magical realm. The film is filled with action, adventure, and frightening foes, but the human element of the story is front and center, which makes it a little less draining than some of its predecessors. That said, 
It suffers from some very slow moments and a sense of directionlessness that makes the film feel very choppy. And with the forthcoming sequel, The Crimes of Grindelwald, just around the corner, we can expect this subseries to start building back up to an all-out war sooner rather than later, which might make Fantastic Beasts 2 feel formulaic. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1 there are a lot of things that do work about Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. For starters, it successfully sets up the big finish and offers some moments of emotional evocation that hadn't yet been seen in the series. It also separates the trio from everything they've ever known and puts the whole Horcrux haunt on the fast track. However, despite the film's stylish scenery and some gutting performances by the leading trio of castmates, the film is pretty boring and seems to unnecessarily eat up screen time with characters sitting around just to justify making the final installment a two-parter. The animated mini-movie and Dobby's Last Stand were standout moments of the whole series, but Deathly Hallows Part 1 could have still been reduced to half an hour or so and tacked on to the following film, and fans wouldn't have missed out on much. It's true, every word. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire After cheating death for three straight years, Harry's fourth year at Hogwarts proved to be his most perilous yet. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire finds the tortured teen wizard competing as the youngest ever contestant in the Tri-Wizard Tournament, and facing down the murderous Dark Lord himself, Voldemort. Although the tournament setting does offer a nice contrast between the kids' fanciful youth with the true grimness of the world that surrounds them, the movie also suffers from some pretty cringeworthy acting. Harry, take my body back, will you? Take my body back to my father. It also fails to find nuance in the secondary characters, like Cedric Diggory and Cho Chang, which means their emotional arcs fall flat. The best part of the film is when Harry and Voldemort finally come face to face, but the whole encounter is limited to just a few minutes and feels like an afterthought that's overshadowed by far less important drama. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone Credit is due to Christopher Columbus for constructing a beautiful vision of Hogwarts and the intricacies of magic found in J.K. Rowling's story in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And ultimately, his casting choices for most of the characters would prove to pay off big time in the long run. However, with the kids being so young in the earliest installment, their line deliveries leave something to be desired. And the film feels more like a cheery Disney movie than the start of a long, hard battle for the boy who lived. With its three-headed beasts, shape-shifting professors, flying brooms, and a larger-than-life chess match, though, there's still some major magic to behold in Harry's first year at Hogwarts. In the end, this first installment of the landmark franchise is just magical enough to keep your attention, but it's also a bit of a snoozer on repeat viewings. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets Chris Columbus's return to adapt the second Harry Potter installment, Chamber of Secrets, is even less impressive than the first. Sure, the film offers up a genuine sense of discovery and even danger to the famed school surrounded by whomping willows, spider-filled forests, and the titular Chamber of Secrets. And all of this happens just as Harry and his friends begin to unravel the dark and twisted history of Tom Riddle. Unfortunately, Chamber of Secrets still sees its stars struggling to find their way as actors, while the director misses big moments with poor tone and pacing choices as well. There are no bad installments to the Harry Potter film series, of course. But with this one sidestepping so many potential power punches written into the book's storyline, well, it's arguably the least magical of them all. Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you love too.